In May, SoCalGas submitted a report called the Draft Seismic Hazard Analysis for Aliso Canyon, and we're going to look at that today. But in order to really understand seismic hazard in this area, you, you kind of need to have the big picture. Aliso Canyon is a gas storage facility that's located up here in the mountains above Porter Ranch. And those mountains are precisely there because two plates are crashing together and pushing the mountains up, and they're sliding along the Santa Susana Fault System, which is shown as these red lines in here. We know a lot about this fault because actually back in uh, the olden days when they were originally drilling the oil wells that, that became the Aliso Canyon Gas Storage Facility, they had to keep careful track of all of the different faults that they crossed because those faults helped determine where the oil was located. And one, from that data set, we know that every single one of the wells at Aliso Canyon crosses at least one strand of the Santa Susana Fault System and in many cases more than one. So earthquakes are clearly going to be a problem here, and California law requires that the California Geological Survey map different zones that are at risk for both direct and indirect impacts of earthquakes. So the direct impacts we talk about uh, include the, the shaking that you feel, for even from a large distance away from an earthquake. That's what we kind of associate with an earthquake. But if you happen to be located very close to a fault, and in class, fact happen to be, have a structure built exactly on top of the fault, you're going to have a problem because in an earthquake, one side of the fault, one block moves one direction, the other side moves the other direction. If you happen to be built a right on top of that, your structure is going to get torn in two. And that's a hazard we call fault rupture hazard. These two things can often lead to some indirect impacts in the earth, uh, including one called liquefaction, where the ground kind of acts like quicksand and these apartment buildings tipped over in that uh, in Japan. Uh, and also landslides can be regularly triggered by earthquakes uh, and are a significant problem as well. When we look at the area around Aliso Canyon in the Santa Susana Mountains, it's a patchwork of different hazards. Uh, we've got blues representing landslide hazard up in the hills. We've got the, the pretty greens down here are liquefaction hazards in the canyons. And this yellow zone represents the fault rupture hazard zone uh, from the Santa Susana Fault. And we know for a fact that the Santa Susana Fault is in fact in this area because in 1971, the San Fernando earthquake ruptured several different traces along the surface in this yellow zone here. You'll see that that yellow zone kind of abruptly stops, and that's not because the fault stops. It's because this area to the west was unmapped for fault rupture hazard. Nobody lived there. Uh, nobody thought it was really worth the time investing in a detailed mapping of where the fault was located because it didn't seem relevant. But of course now, when we think about where the Aliso Canyon storage facility is, with the boundaries here shown in a different yellow and each one of these dots being one of the active wells, uh, we now realize that there's a, a, indeed a problem. It may look like these wells all just narrowly miss the fault, but that's because it's a little bit misleading to draw a fault as a simple line on a map. In fact, these are three-dimensional structures that dip back down into the hillside, and all of the wells cut across the fault uh, down, down underground. We also know that there's a major problem uh, for earthquakes because in the 1994 Northridge earthquake, one well collapsed as a result of the ground shaking, and that well has been sort of repaired and repurposed and is now actually one of the active wells in the Aliso Canyon storage facility. So how big an earthquake are we talking? Well, the USGS and others have estimated that this could be up to a magnitude 7.3 earthquake, which is about the same energy release as eight Northridge earthquakes from 1994. Recognizing this, Dogger mandated that SoCal Gas do a really detailed seismic hazard analysis study, and SoCal Gas commissioned this as an independent analysis done by academics and scientists from around the country, and it's actually a pretty detailed study, and I, I want to give them credit for doing a, a very in-depth job. They started off by figuring out and answering questions like, where are the faults located? And once we know where the faults are located, how big are the earthquakes going to be? And once we know about the earthquakes, what sort of damage will those do to the well? And once we know that the wells are damaged, how much will they leak? And once we know that they leak, how much gas is going to flow up to the surface? And they went through step by step by step in a series of reports. I think there are 10 reports. Each one of them is, is 50, 100 pages long, uh, representing the work of several scientists for a couple months probably. This is a substantial effort. So what did they find? Well, in terms of faults, they of course know that active faults cut across the wells. We already knew that, and that we can expect big earthquakes. We already knew that. 
Uh, in terms of the well damage, they found that wells will leak when they rip apart, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few moments, uh, that some of the gas will remain trapped underground, but in the worst case, 62 wells are going to leak simultaneously. The study actually goes through uh, many of these direct and indirect impacts. Uh, I'm going to focus in on fault rupture because that's the most substantial impact. It's the one we have to worry about the most. So, uh, the ground shaking, they find that seven wells might leak in a really strong distant earthquake. Uh, in terms of landslides, they have a pretty detailed couple of chapters, but then they end with this kind of vague conclusion that only a few wells are located in landslide hazard zones. Um, and in terms of liquefaction, that's not relevant to the area. There actually won't be liquefaction happening there. So let's zoom in to fault rupture hazards. So we talked about how in an earthquake, the two sides of the fault will move in opposite directions. And the question then becomes, how much will they move? And they answer the question, what's the probability of different size earthquakes in the next 50 years, which is a reasonable expected lifetime of the Aliso Canyon facility? And they found that there's about a 10% chance of the two sides moving about 6 inches, a lot like this picture here. Uh, and 6 inches doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but remember, we're looking at uh, wells that are only about 7 inches in diameter. So when you start moving a 7-inch uh, circle 6 inches uh, apart, uh, you start coming into some problems. There's also a 5% chance, a little bit less, that the amount of slip could be larger, like, say, 2.5 feet. And this is a picture from the recent Ridgecrest earthquake. It's a little bit more than 2.5 feet in this picture, but you can get a sense of what we're talking about here, of the two, two blocks moving quite a bit. And now that little 7-inch well is going to be torn quite a bit. And there's even a 2% chance that you could have 8 feet or more of slip. And this is a classic picture on top here from the 1906 earthquake of a fence that was cut by about 8 feet. Um, and imagine this instead of being a fence being a pipeline carrying natural gas, and the gas is flowing along, flowing along, and all of a sudden it no longer has the other side of the pipe to flow into, and it leaks into the formation around it. To understand how that much movement by the earth is actually going to impact the wells, we need to have a better picture of what these wells actually look like underground. They have two parts. The outside is a, a steel pipe called casing uh, that goes down. They, they connect these segments together for miles and miles and miles, and they're about seven inches in diameter in most of the wells at the depth where they, they cross the Santa Susana Fault. And inside of that, I like to think of it as a straw within a straw. Uh, there's a, a thinner steel tube uh, called tubing. And under regulations that were enacted after the blowout, uh, the, the state now requires two layers of containment, which means that the gas is only allowed to flow along this inner thin tubing up to the surface. And in case something happens to that and it breaks, uh, the gas will leak out and there will still be a second layer of containment called the casing. So our question is, if we start tearing apart this, uh, this uh, pipe in an earthquake, uh, will it be able to maintain those two layers of containment? And so they actually took these uh, models of these two materials into a laboratory and subjected them to sample earthquakes, and this is what the results look like. They ran uh, 18 different uh, attempts of this, and the outer casing broke in all 18 cases. It's a brittle steel pipe, and if you move it several feet, it's not going to last. The inner tubing is a little bit more flexible, uh, and so sometimes it ended up sort of bending and, uh, and curving like you see here. Um, in other cases, it parted uh, completely, but in 16 of the 18 cases, even the ones where it bent a little bit, it sprung leaks and released gas out, and we lost containment of the gas. Uh, both layers of protection were broken. And this is why I want to really point out the importance of doing an independent analysis, uh, because when SoCal Gas submitted its risk management plan back in 2017, uh, they said something along the lines of, well, when you have this sort of movement, uh, it doesn't normally leak. Uh, but they included no supporting evidence of that doesn't normally leak. And when people actually took it into a lab and looked at it, actually, it does normally leak 16 out of 18 times. And this is why it's important to, to actually get real data from people that don't have a vested interest in what's going on. So in terms of that much offset on these different earthquakes that we predicted, um, what's going to happen? Well, for that small earthquake that has about a 10% chance, about 40 of the wells will fail. The larger earthquake, when you get to a 5% chance earthquake, uh, 48 of the 62 wells will fail. And if you get up to that 2% chance in the next 50 years, 
all 62 wells will fail simultaneously. Well, if a well rips apart, uh, this is a slice through the earth showing the different layers, and this is showing many, many thousands of feet down. In fact, I've stacked up 15 Statues of Liberty to give you a sense of how far down these uh, wells cross some of the, the fault strands. Uh, and there's all this rock above that, and it turns out that these rock layers have actually successfully trapped the gas down uh, underground, the oil and gas, for millions of years. So it's possible that they can keep things trapped for longer. But there are two pathways that we have to particularly worry about where the gas can escape more quickly. Uh, one of those is along the outside of the casing. Uh, if the cement isn't uh, complete or if there's uh, problems with the cement, that uh, there are little gaps and cracks, uh, gas can pretty easily escape along the outside of a well. Uh, another way gas can reach the surface is actually moving along the faults themselves. And the study's pretty comprehensive. It actually looked at both of these two possible pathways and calculated out how much gas will leak out. And they actually ran hundreds of thousands of simulations with different assumptions. Maybe this layer on top is a little bit um, harder to flow through than the layer below, or no, maybe it's actually the other way around. They tried all of those cases so they could get a good sense. And they found in their conclusions that many cases show no gas flow to the surface. Uh, but the great thing about science and their modeling methodology is they can actually quantify the uncertainty. How many of the cases showed no flow to the surface and how much else? So if a single well fails, their modeling showed that the middle of the road case, where 50% of the situations were worse and 50% were better, has a flow rate of 0.01 to 0.1 million cubic feet per day which is relatively small when you think about the uh, blowout in 2015 of SS25. That had a flow rate of peaking of between 80 and maybe up as high as 90 million cubic feet per day. But of course, if I told you that there's an earthquake and in, you have a 50% chance of being just fine, you might wonder what about the other 50%? And good news is that they actually provide us that information in the report and quantify that. Uh, they found that in 10% of the cases, the flow was higher than 10 million cubic feet per day, which is still smaller than the SS25 blowout, but getting to be something that's pretty significant. But of course, this slide is actually completely irrelevant, because we're not expecting a single well to fail. We're expecting 62 of them to fail, all simultaneously, and the good news is that they modeled that situation, a very complex uh, integrated model where they look at the amount of gas flowing through the whole reservoir with 62 wells failed. And again, the middle of the road case, where 50% of the situations that they modeled were worse and 50% were better, um, you get a relatively low flow rate. It's 0.25 million cubic feet per day, which is way lower than the 80 that we peaked at in 2015. But the worst case scenario, or the 10% of cases being worse than, you actually end up with 250 million cubic feet per day. That's about three times what we had in the 2015 blowout. And when you add up the total amount of gas leaking out over five years, you're looking at eight times the total emissions from the 2015 blowout. This is a substantial disaster. But there's also something else that is a problem, which is that uh, the draft report that they submitted uh, has, has a methodology problem in it. They didn't quite do things just right. Uh, they used the pre-earthquake measurements of rock permeability to figure out how quickly the gas could escape. But earthquakes, they loosen up old fractures and they create new ones. And in fact, uh, it's typically been seen that permeability increases 10 or even 100 times higher than pre-earthquake levels, which means that gas can escape more easily, which means that all those probabilities that they gave us are going to be inaccurate. It's going to be more likely to have higher flow rates than they actually told us. And so they need to do their modeling again to, to, to account for this and do a proper job of dealing with post-earthquake permeabilities. I've shared my comments and concerns with, with Dogger in a letter dated May 5th, and I received a reply from their office saying that they didn't see, did receive it and that my comments are going to be reviewed and considered. And so I'm hoping that that will happen, and we're working with our legislators to continue following up with them to make sure that that happens. So a quick summary, uh, the worst case scenario is eight times the emissions of the 2015 blowout. Uh, if we have a large earthquake, uh, we're going to have a very large leak on our hands. Uh, 
in terms of how likely is this worst case scenario? Well, the authors need to revise their model to provide us an accurate probability, and we're hoping that they will do that. Uh, but if we just take them at face value with their current model, which is an underestimate, we know that there's a 5% chance of a sufficiently large earthquake in the next 50 years. And if that earthquake actually happens, we've got at least a 10% chance of this worst case scenario happening. So it's up to our policymakers to figure out, is this a level of risk that we're willing to accept in our backyards and in our neighborhoods, or is there something that they want to do about it? And that's where we are right now, and that's what we're waiting for.